Thank you so much for such a warm welcome. So delighted uh, to really be here with you today and to share this message of hope that springs right out of our text today. I want you to know that I've been trekking uh, with you and your worship services through this sermon series, Gold. And I've so enjoyed watching all of these banners kind of spring to life and describe the salvation schema found in the first part of Philippians, how God is at work in the world inviting all people to the hope that is found in Christ alone. That deeply resonates with me. So thank you for welcoming me here today. The Apostle Paul's goal in this letter, not unlike his goal in other letters like Romans and Colossians, is that he might provide words of encouragement and instruction about how we can grow in our love and how we can learn to discern and practice what matters most. Paul puts into focus this example of the love and the justice and the mercy of Jesus Christ And he asks of us that this would be the lens through which we learn to see the world. And it takes practice to do that. And ideally, it's done in a community of faith, such as the congregational life of this church. In other words, Paul is saying that there is a way to be grounded, a way to live life in the context of all that we face that actually can make sense. Paul describes this as a life of contentment, a life of peace. All of life in our waking, in our working, in our parenting, in our neighboring, in all that we are called to do and to be, we are meant to orient our life into life-giving ways of being in the world. Now today's text um, I'll read it here in just a moment. It comes from chapter 4, beginning at verse 4 and going on all the way through verse 12. Let's listen to Paul's wisdom of how we are invited to live in these days. It's lofty language. It's also very practical language. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me, writes Paul, or seen in me, put it into practice. The God of peace will be with you. I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This text invites us to consider who are the people in our lives that help us to think about such lofty things, to look at how it is in a life to be about these kinds of things to think on these things, to to meditate and to ponder who among you is commendable to this task. Well, the Apostle Paul says, look at me, 
And I am not standing here today saying, look at me. I still have a long ways to go. I'm very grateful, though, for Paul's words and his invitation to say, look at how I live my life. Practice these things. And the peace of God will be with you. Ah, that is what we want, is it not? This peace of God. In the early church, Paul and his colleagues, in their agreements and in their disagreements, in them we see exemplars of how to care deeply for one another in astonishing ways that continue to inspire the church today. I want us to just think for a moment about who some of those early leaders were that were exemplars to the early church as it was taking off and growing. Does anyone come to mind for you? And if they do, just say their name out loud. Timothy. Timothy. Excellent. Peter. Peter. Yeah, the rock. Anybody that Paul disagreed with at some point? Barnabas, come, Barnabas comes to mind, yeah, yeah, uh, Titus, Priscilla and Aquila, Phoebe, Lydia, so many of these exemplars in the early church offer us a way to, through their lives, see what it means to be a people of faith. We need exemplars, I would offer today to remind us that our faith transcends time. It endures, and so shall we endure. Today, who do we have today? Who are exemplars that we can look to, to inspire us, to help us see that there can be a quality of life that is worth pursuing? Whose stories could you listen to all day long and they wouldn't get old? I know that for me, I particularly enjoy hearing stories of unlikely friendships. People who, through an awful lot of adversity or disagreement, discover one day we have a friendship built on really genuine things. I love stories like that. Stories that cross the aisle in politics. Stories of unlikely friendships across racial divides. And dare I add, across theological differences. Friendships are possible and good to come about in these circumstances. Last week, I was reminded of one such friendship. It was in a very public setting. And she began like this. We really didn't get along very well at first. We had to learn what it meant to be friends. She would add their approaches to nearly everything differed, sometimes dramatically, though they often found themselves seated around a common table. They rarely saw eye to eye. They held different policy views, and they were policy makers, so that mattered. Although they were the same age, their lives had been shaped by very different backgrounds. And it took years, she said, for them to begin to appreciate what was good and true and gentle and genuine about the other. He was Episcopalian, she grew up Roman Catholic and later in life discovered she had Jewish roots. He was in the military. She was a diplomat. She wore a pen. He wore a lot of medals. She admittedly said, quote, I was a mere mortal female civilian, and in the wake of Operation Storm, he was the hero of the Western world. Who am I talking about? Colin Powell and his friendship with Madeleine Albright. Yes, exactly. It was fun to me. It was encouraging to me to hear that they were able to develop such a deep and enduring friendship despite their differences. In time, she said, we really did become the closest of friends. 
exemplars of friendship shaped by things that are life-giving. These things transcend time. And we caught a glimpse of that in Madeline's words at Colin's uh, funeral. Let this timeless standard, Paul says, be the way in which you see the world. Learn to see the world through what matters most, which for us is Jesus, his ministry, his words, his way of being in the world, his welcome that transcended so many borders and boundaries. Am I right? His stretched out arms, his death, and his resurrection. Let this be what grounds you in the world, writes Paul. Settle your life deeply into the soil of the goodness and the hope and the justice and the beauty of the gospel of Christ. Think on these things. In other words, think through Jesus. Let Jesus be the lens at which you look at life. Let it be the lens through which you see friendships. Let Jesus be the lens through which you see society and race and gender and sexuality. And when we do this, as we learn to do this, as we learn to practice applying this lens to our life, we will see reality more clearly, Paul says. Let these things ground you and you will find the peace of Christ that surpasses understanding. The invitation truly to each of us today is to let the peace of Christ do in your life what you cannot do for yourself. Welcome the peace of Christ into your life. The point is that one's lens on life matters. In the first service today, in the second row, right about here, sat what I'm assuming was a grandfather whose grandchild was going to be singing a little later in the service, and he had this giant lens on his camera. It was perfect. I didn't even ask him to come. He's just there, so I just kind of wanted to describe it and share it with you. Um, The vocation of photographers is largely about focus. I'm particularly drawn to the photography of nature. It just stirs something in me. Photographers of nature do their best to show up when nature is showing off. And they learn to bring the right tools and somehow they figure out how they're going to patiently wait sometimes in really difficult conditions for just that right moment to take a picture. Craig uh, Goodwin is one such photographer. When my family and I lived in Spokane uh, for a little while, we got to know Craig and his photography. And I want to invite you to take a look at a couple of the images that Craig has captured. Right? This image was taken at a place in Oregon called Cape Disappointment. Periodically, nature produces what some call a king wave. This is a king wave hitting a rocky outcrop right above a lighthouse. Doesn't that seem perfect? Yeah, it's stunning. It's breathtaking. Can you just imagine the roar of it if you were there and the mist and how wet we would all be getting if we were around that king wave just taking it in the wonder of seeing this and thinking, will the rock still be there? After a wave like that, the intensity of it just seems like the rock might break. Something like this, we might think, is something that's a -a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to see. And if you live long enough, you know that life can sometimes feel like this, like a king wave crashing into the rocks. Our lives feel like this sometimes. Equally as beautiful and completely different is an image that Craig captured 
at Bannon Beach, when the waves recede, and the photographer adjusts their focus in a new way, seeing what remains is quite beautiful. Seeing what was there all along. This image is called Hearts in the Sand. The beauty of a puddle of water surrounded, surrounding a rock, reflecting the sky, inviting us to appreciate the beauty of still moments like this, quiet surface, water at rest. It is, for me, a quintessential, quintessential image of peace, contentment, and rest. The life we so often long for, I think, is captured in this image. We live in the midst of a very restless, chaotic world, and it can cause our souls to also grow quite restless. And the truth of God is that God provides a savior, a rock, a redeemer. In the midst of all of that, it was there all along, this rock. So how do we find this rock? How do we come to appreciate what our soul's well-being needs, which is a peace that surpasses our understanding? And then from that place of peace as we find it, the question emerges for those around us, how do we carry this peace? How do we share it for the sake of others? Truly, this is the heart of the gospel as I see it. Peace like this, Paul says, the world cannot give. No matter how ardently we strive for it, work for it, achieve degrees and spend time in academia and faithfully put money away in our 401ks and do all that the world so faithfully rewards us for, none of that can actually give us peace. We want it to. We think it might. But it's just not true. Even when blessed with health and vitality, when we're honest with ourselves, none of this satisfies a soul. Like knowing the God of peace. That's why we show up here to worship, right? We need this reorientation in our worlds to remind us that these are the things that matter most. I want us to focus in particularly on verse 9 in this passage. A life of contentment and peace, Paul writes, comes about through practice. Does that surprise you? Practice. Our faith requires practice, putting into practice the things that we hear and learn, the things that we receive, that we come to know, in order for them to stick, to produce that wellspring of peace within our soul, it takes practice. In the time that we have left together today, I want to lift up two practices in particular I want to commend them to you, and we'll practice one of them even as we wrap up. First, a practice that I have witnessed here at University Place Presbyterian Church, as I have witnessed Pastor Aaron share deeply sad news in his life, I have seen him practice leaning in, leaning in for support, leaning into the prayer of those who surround him. And really, in that way, leaning into the peace that only God can provide. Proud of you for doing that, by the way. 
I have seen him practice leaning in for support, and I would offer that we all need to be doing that when life provides king waves in our experience. I have seen the elders of this church practice gospel caring, gospel caring, a loving discernment, a practice of prayer that is rooted in enduring care for this church, for all of you, all of us are blessed by their ministry. I have watched them practice in their discernment and in their prayer an affirmation of the continuing call of God on Aaron's life and ministry. This is the church at work. This, friends, is a church that works. It's a beautiful thing. I love it. I am blessed by it, by its witness. I could not ask for a more compassionate response. And I urge you, too, to lean in. When you need care and support, lean into the care of others at this church. It will be good for your soul. As we grow in faith, I think each of us finds in our own way practices of peace that work for us. Some of my friends would say, I go for a walk when I need to find some peace in my life. That's what works for me. That's how my soul is wired. I need to be out in nature, wind, rain, sun, whatever. I'm outside. That is what blesses my soul. Others, um, the introverts among us, particularly enjoy time to yourself. Am I right? Time to do your own soul's tending. Quietness or just time away from others can be another practice that produces peace. For others, the more people in the room, the better, right? The extroverts among us can actually find peace in the midst of a crowd. It's a lovely and amazing thing. So I would just commend to you as you and your spiritual practice find your soul to be blessed, enriched, growing, and at peace. Notice that. Do whatever you can to build time like that into your life. Permission to ask of those around you that you would have time like that in your life. And I know it's really hard if you've got young kids at home or in many circumstances this is hard to do. But as you do have an opportunity to, please build practices of peace into your life. Because God meets us in these places. And God's goodness is known to us in this way. Finally, I have chose today to invite us all into a practice of embodied prayer, a way of pursuing peace with God by having an honest conversation with God. And I think it can be a powerful thing to use our bodies in a time of prayer to give witness to what is going on in our lives. So if you have something in your hands right now, I would just ask you to set it aside. I know there are some sermon note takers among us, or maybe you're just holding the hand of somebody near you or whatever, we're gonna need free hands, all right? And uh, warm up those hands. This is gonna involve three steps, uh, making a fist, opening our hands, and turning them over. It's that simple. Friends, spend t- some time, some stillness, some time to reflect goodness and peace and just invite this into our lives. So the first step, if you would please make a fist, hold your hands tight, facing up, and just let God know in the quiet of your heart something that is burdening you today, something that you know Your body knows because it feels it. Maybe you carry burdens in your shoulders or you just know it in your gut. Something that is true 
of you today that is a burden, share that with God. Tell God about it. Not so much the information of it because God already knows. Tell God about how it feels, how it is with you about this burden. Let's just listen to this music for a moment and invite God's Spirit to minister to us about this burden. Holy Spirit, thank you for being present with us as we acknowledge this burden. And now I invite you to open, release that fist, and turn your hands, palms down. Release that burden and invite God to carry it with you. God longs to be with us in our burdens. God is that rock in the midst of the waters that knows all that we face in life with us as close as our breath, knowing us so intimately. Sharing that burden, carrying it with God is his quiet of this music, let God's Spirit know how much it matters to you that God carries this with you this day. And finally, in a posture of openness and receiving, I invite you to turn your hands, palms up to the heavens, and ask God to heal these open hands, opening our hands to what God is doing in us, through us, in our families, and in our neighborhoods, and in this world. Oh, Holy Spirit, we offer to you now these open hands. Finally, oh God, our peace, we ask that you would remind us to turn to you not just when we're in church, but also in our work days and in the midst of deadlines and in carpools and over sinks of filled with dirty dishes and in times of delight and in times of dismay when waves crash and in the quiet of still waters and in every moment in between, oh God, remind us that it is in you, oh God, that we live and we move and we have our very being for your loving care this day and always. We give you thanks and praise and we give you all the glory, oh God, our rock and our redeemer. And all of God's people together said, Amen.
the peace of Christ be with you.